conversation. Um, I have a quick overview of Mechanics Institute, and then I'm going to read the bios of our two fantastic presenters this evening. Uh, who is here at Mechanics Institute for the very first time? y'all can remind us if, if we're not doing it. Okay, so um, what we're going to be taking a look at here is uh, not only the cable cars because of the anniversary, but also a little bit of um, Halliday's early work in the mines, his connection with the Mechanics Institute also because, uh, you know, without Andrew Halliday, uh, you know, cable cars may have come because he wants to be the first to think of some kind of a cable system. He, you know, goes all the way back to the 1830s. 
uh, and earlier. But he was the first that really kind of perfected one. And in building the Clay Street Hill cable car line, uh, he drew a lot on his work in the mine. So we're going to take a look at a lot of eclectic stuff. Um, we'll probably tell a few stories. We may even get off track. Uh, you know, if we do, just just Alyssa pull us back because you know you start telling stories in San Francisco, and pretty soon you're five blocks away and around the corner. Okay. Well, the, the early here is the Clay Street Hill car, but we'll be returning to that. All right. So let me see if I remember what Alyssa told me. Okay. So. Andrew Smith Howley, uh, born Andrew Smith. His father was also Andrew Smith. Um, his father held several patents for wire rope. Wire rope was basically the name in the 19th century that they gave the cable. Uh, So-called mainly because the uses of it on ships were really early, and it replaced hemp rope because it was stronger and more durable. And we'll talk a little bit about how that's made up. But um, Andrew Howley worked with his father his godfather, uh, Sir Andrew Halliday, I believe, a lot of common names here, uh, was the physician to uh, King William IV, I think, and Queen Victoria. So he took the surname Halliday because I know he thought it would bring him good luck, it would sound better, um, but that's why he took the name Halliday and became Andrew Smith Halliday. He and his father were engaged in surveying, wire rope, they held several patents. Uh, Donald will be giving you a little bit more about patents as we go through. But uh, he was a very industrious young man, and he was involved in a lot of things, and it kind of affected his health. So to sort of take the waters in a way, he and his father departed during the gold rush and came to California, landing here in 1852. Uh, Halliday did a lot of work in the mines. He did some blacksmithing. Uh, he did some surveying. Uh, they tried their luck at prospecting. Well, by 1852, you know, the placer gold was beginning to run out. Um, and his father easily got discouraged, and he went home. Andrew decided to stay and try it for himself. Uh, he did, I think, very short amount of prospecting. He said, you know, the dirt showed but a pale hint of gold, and uh, he thought, well, it was a better part of valor to uh, not really uh, pursue that line of work. So he put his knowledge of surveying and mechanics to work uh, in turning out, well, eventually turning out wire rope, but blacksmithing, um, you know. And what he had developed was his uh, cable and his tramway system, because starting about the 1850s or so, tramways really were popping up all over the gold country. And many, much of the system is similar to cable cars, but basically, and you can still see some of the towers are still around in certain places. It was a way of conveying the ore, cheaper, less labor, and of course, doesn't matter what the train is, doesn't matter what the weather's like, you can go over gorges or chasms or whatever, so it's a huge, huge subject, it's fascinating, we're only going to touch on it briefly with Halliday, because Halliday was only one of many. But he's kind of credited for the first tramway, or the first real working tramway system uh, in the gold mines. OK, so as I mentioned, um, wire rope is used on ships. It replaced hemp. Also, hemp, you know, if you're using it with hoist and stuff, it could break and did break. This was much safer. It was much more reliable. And of course, it lasted longer. And you can see here the basic. Um, diagram I put up the wire rope because this is basically very close to what's used today. Cable is still turned out. There are many styles of cable and widths and everything, but we'll look a little at the cable used in the cable car system, but it really is a direct replica of this. And, uh, okay. So you can see that it's basically uh, you know, several wires twisted together into one. I think the ratio is 19 and 6 in an out 19 wires, strands wired together to make six you know, big wires. Uh, with kind of a sisal core, which is a kind of a, well, we, we often used to say hemp, but then everybody in the audience would start snickering, so, you know, you cannot smoke cables. Uh, you know, people have asked, but, you know, uh, they've also asked, it's like a chocolate bar, but that's mostly the kids. Um, so, this is kind of the basic design you can see here. This has got the, uh, the wire cable center uh, with cable cars because you want the wire to be able to turn. They use a sisal core, which that kind of gives it some flexibility. Um, but it comes from the work on ships with wire rope, and that's where his father uh, and Andrew Holly also had some patents. And patents are very important in this history, as Don will show you. Okay, this is uh, not a very good photo, unfortunately, I'm sorry, but this is an example of the aerial tram. I don't know if that's Halliday there, but every picture I show you is gonna have Halliday in it, apparently. Uh, people say, you see that? That's Andrew Halliday. So that's Andrew Halliday. 
But this is the kind of tower they would set up at intervals, and they have these what they call pulleys or sheaves, depending on the size, to uh, convey the wire rope. And this is a um, sorry, I got a bit of a tremor here. Uh, this is a single cable for coming and going. You'll see some that are double for a little more stability. But basically, the problem is that even with the early tramways, you had to uh, take the bucket off and unload it. You know detach it from the cable, uh, where Halley came up with kind of a unique system that would actually carry the buckets and there was an automatic sort of, you know, doohickey that would gut the, uh, gut the cables. And, and what it did, it saved time, it saved labor, and it quickly became the very popular bike. By about 1860s, even 1870, he was still working on this. Uh, and it was, according to the people who used it, it was one of the most favorite tramways in the mine. It was very dependable and it very well built, and it did say it also could carry water, it could carry, you know, ore which it carried, it carried passengers, because as they say, terrain, gorges, chasms, weather, doesn't make a difference, because you don't have to pave the roads to get there. And that was a, a huge outlay for some cable companies, uh, I mean, excuse me, some uh, uh, mining companies in the early days. So how did even before the cable car made quite a bit of money on mining? These are just a couple of drawings uh, from the Bancroft of the tramway system, the endless rope, which I'll explain in a minute. Uh, and here's the single. And this is a great picture. It's actually not known whether this one ever, ever went into operation because the single cable apparently wasn't quite as dependable as the double one, which you've got in this picture here. You can see where the carriers, here's the buckets and the carriers, the rope, uh, the wire rope, uh, the space intervals with pulleys on them, and they would operate by steam, and they uh, would convey the ore down to the crushers, or you know, the prospectors died out pretty early, and then it was you know, quartz crushing, hydraulic. There were a lot of different uh, ways of mining, but they all cost money. And so, how these endless tramways became very important. Uh, fascinating subject. There's a great book, great book called um, I think it's called Writing the Wire Rope, isn't it, Don? Yeah, yeah. It tells you everything you want. Writing the high wire. The high wire. Yeah. Great titles. They they all just use. Uh, this one uh, is kind of, it ties right into cable cars, so that's why we wanted to spend a little time on it. Okay, I just want to show you a couple things that I've been talking about. Um, this is the frame here, you can see the, those tall frames uh, to hold the, uh, basically to hold the cable at so many intervals to support it, okay? And we've also got the buckets here. They were permanently attached, where originally they were kind of hung on the cable and you had to take them off of. These are permanently attached, and then the bucket is affixed to that, and by means of some mechanism, it, it em empties automatically. So, Halley was really quite an inventor. He really came up with some interesting ideas. This is important to cable cars, but it's also important to Halley because this grip pulley, or what they call the bull wheel, was fastened on different ends, and that's what kept the cable from slipping which is also a problem with cable cars, but it was a problem with cable cars. So it alternately grips, and then when the tension is relieved, it opens up and lets the cable move freely, which is part of the cable car mechanism as well. So Halley thought a lot about these ideas, and when he began thinking of a system, uh, this really was uh, instrumental to it. He already had it kind of worked out in his mind. He also built suspension bridges because the use of wire rope and he built several of them. You can see a few of them here up in the Klamath, the American River, Trinity, Stanislaus. Uh, but a lot of these suspension bridges using his wire rope, or people would buy the wire rope. John Riebling was another company back east that was one of the first, really before Howley, maybe even to, uh, to make wire rope. And these were used in the suspension bridges, but you know, there were a lot of bridges, there's a lot of bridge building going on uh, up in the mines. Oh, and across the western states, really, with the gold rush. And, mining and the Comstock load and all of that. Uh, this one is an example, it's a picture, a little fuzzy, but this is the Alexander Bridge he built on the Fraser River. It's a well-known one. This is a little controversial because there was a big flood in, um, was that like 1920, Don, or? I think so, 1920, and it washed yeah. the whole thing out. Now these yeah. suspension bridges were supposed to be tougher than that, but uh, this one did get washed out. I'm not sure, I don't think they rebuilt this one, but. Uh, it's an example of a bridge that Halley actually uh, provided the wire for, and some of the specs. He had built them himself. Companies were already hired to build these. So again, Halley, a man of many talents. 
Halliday left the mines and moved to San Francisco, where he had several companies. Uh, A.S. Halliday and Company, you can see here, that was one of his early companies, about 1869 or so, 1860s. And uh, he was making most of the wire rope. His wire rope became very well known because it was strong, it was durable. Apparently, they say it lasted longer than others. Uh, when he first came here, they said he melted every horseshoe he could find to get enough metal to make these cables because it just cost a lot out in California. But he did very well. He had several employees, had several offices, and um, several of them across actually the western states. You can see here, um, this one was on California Street. Uh, this one, I can't really see well, I'm sorry, but he had a couple offices around, and as he became more and more successful, he opened bigger. Finally, he ended up on North Point Street, taking up about a block in North Beach with the California Wire uh, Rope. Company. So he did very well. He bought the cable car. He was really a set. In fact, so much so that, you know, you know, of course, he was instrumental in the mechanics library, uh, not only in uh, supporting it, but getting funds for it. Uh, he advocated free education for men and women, for boys and girls. Uh, he was a founding regent of UC. He was involved in a lot of things, including the early ASPC, which is going to lead us right into cable cars. But he did have several successful companies. Okay, this was California Wireworks. That was the office down in Fremont. Um, and then he had a huge complex, like I said, out in North Beach. And you'll notice they mention um, uh, okay, Halley's Endless Wire Ropeway for transporting. That was his design, so-called endless wire because it was spliced. So it ran in a continuous loop with no deviation. Even today, they used on the cable cars. It really is fascinating to watch them splice it to get the chance because it has to be totally, you know, uh, the same diameter and everything. But that's what he used that was so successful in the mines. Okay, so that's the background. Now Don and I are gonna get a little bit into, uh, you ready Don? We're going to get a little bit into what everybody came to hear. Go for it. Uh, okay. The Clay Street Hill Railroad Company, uh, 1873. Of course, we just had the anniversary, the 150th. Now, um, that sounds quite grand. Uh, it didn't start that way. Halliday uh, had an idea for it, and later it becomes very dramatic, and I'll tell you that story in a minute. But he said he'd been thinking about it ever since, oh, 1868, 69, 70. He was kind of mulling because the man sold wire rope, and I'm taking nothing away from Halliday, but this was a whole new market for his wire rope, a very good But he couldn't get this thing going. Most people just kind of laughed at it. They called it Halliday's folly. It'll never work. He couldn't find financing. Uh, he had to secure um, a street to build it on. He started thinking of California because Knob Hill was very much um, underdeveloped, because nobody wanted to walk up the hills. You carry groceries up those hills? Forget it. So, and actually that cable car made Knob Hill, Knob Hill, you know, which comes from the old Nabob, so wealthy. They were back down in South Park at the time. So Halliday thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll do California, but that didn't work quite right. And the funny thing was in early days of transit, people or companies would go out and they would buy a, a franchise from the city on a street. They had no intention of building any kind of transit but they wanted to make sure that if you wanted to use it, you had to buy them out. So it was real cutthroat. And you know, somebody would buy one way, so that if you had, you know, if you had a two-way line or something, you couldn't get the other street. And they were always trying to do things. We're going to talk about that with patents. This was the this was the Gilded Age. It was real cutthroat, and you know, make money however you can. Transit was pretty um, pretty primitive in the city. People did not ride horses like you see in the movies. They walked, especially in San Francisco. You know, wasn't much in New York City, set around the square. Uh, this is the corner of um, Montgomery and, uh, is it Kearney? I, I'm sorry, I forget, Clay and, Clay and Kearney, I think. Um, very close to where we are. And uh, you see there on the bottom is an omnibus coach. And what those were, they came from France, actually. And omnibus meaning in Latin, you know, everybody Everybody could ride this coach. Well, they're kind of like mini stage coaches, you know, we all see in the westerns. And you entered through the back, there was a little step that led down, and you went up the back, and you handed your money to the driver, or not. And um, when you want to get off, you pull a little rope, catch his leg, and he stopped, or not. Um, 
The drivers really enjoyed racing each other, so they were always taking out like street lamps and you know corner poles, and the horses were getting exhausted. And you can imagine riding those over and San Francisco streets might be bumpy now, but they weren't any better then. So riding those over city streets, and there were only about two lines: the red line, the yellow line. This is the yellow line. One ran North Beach, one ran to the Mission. The city required you to plank roads. We'll look a little bit, a little bit of that in a minute, but um, they were pretty rough because most franchises didn't want to spend the money. Well, along comes about 1869, the horse car. The 1850s was the era of the omnibus. Uh, good enough, not great. Windy, cold. So horse cars, lay down the rail, and you get a nice smooth ride. Can accommodate more people, although a horse car really doesn't travel too much faster than you can walk. But this was on an advertisement in San Francisco. Why walk when you can ride? So, you know, I mean, uh, they were kind of forward thinking even then. But these were great, and it was a real bonus for cities, as long as you didn't have to deal with the hill. Great on the flat, not so great on the hill, especially on slippery days. So, this brings us to the famous story of Jackson Street on a cold, wet day in San Francisco. I've always been told it was winter. The horse car is going up Jackson Street, which is very, very wet, very, very steep. And the horses slip on the cobbles. My grandmother used to tell me about this. She said you'd see those horses being dragged because the uh, driver had a kind of a brake, kind of a chain brake. But, but those broke, and this one snapped, apparently. And they went back down the hill dragging the horses, and of course the horses had to be destroyed. Halliday himself, in his memoir, said he witnessed this. So he said, at that point, I determined that I was going to reduce the cruelty to animals. And I was going to find some way to alleviate that, but also give citizens um, you know, a real dependable way to, to, to ride on hills. Plus, wire rope. You know, he stole wire rope. <laughs> OK, so I showed you the ship rope. It's just for a look here. And we got a couple little pieces up here if you want to take a look. This is the cable that Halliday created for the cable car, which is basically just another form of the type they used on ships. This is, uh, as I said, about um, 16 strand, uh, 19 strands, six wires, a little sisal in the middle. This is a picture of a few years ago of being delivered to the, um, tell me, is that you in the picture? Are you, are you with the cable in the picture? Delivering it? No? I would have sworn that was you. <laughs> But this is being delivered to the powerhouse, which is always kind of a very cool bump. You can see the size of the, the cable they bring in. And, and you know, the cable has a life. You know, it lasts. It gets worn. It doesn't have as much uh, strength. It stretches. And so you know, about well, it varies. But I think about every is it a whole year that it goes? Uh, California, California, a little bit. California, a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Depends really on the loads and the stretch. You know, when they when it wears, they have to attach it the new cable and pull a new one through the system. So it really is pretty much the prototype Halley used uh, on the ships. This is just a drawing. I'll show you some different pictures. This is kind of a spec Halley drew for the uh, Clay Street Hill. And you can tell that what he did was he got rid of the horse, kept the trailer, and hitched it to what they call a dummy. And the dummy has the grip. Now that's the pivotal thing with Halley, is that he had this endless ropeway system in the mines, but the grip which drives the car, that was the real innovation. That's what we want to give Halley some credit for. But of course, other people came up with different grips and much better grips. But that had really been a problem throughout the cable uh, transit history, even back in the 1830s. You know, uh, there's a great picture of the Piedmont Consolidated Railway Company. Had an overhead grip, real nice, until it lifted the car off the track. So um, they had a lot of problems with the grips. And Halley had one. It's not the best grip, I'll tell you right now. But it was an innovation. And you all have a better picture, but you can see it right here, extending from the wheels here down onto the cable. And these are the yokes, this is the roadway. Because one provision of operating a transit system was you couldn't, you couldn't interfere with the traffic and you couldn't put anything on the roadway that would stick up or become an obstacle. Okay, there's the uh, outline of it. Uh, Doc, you want to explain the? Yeah, well I showed that's the, that is a, a screw grip that Halliday developed. Uh, Later, they turned out to a lever system was a lot better. But you, you turn that screw and that graph, I can't. This is the upper and the small yeah, wheel. Yeah. And then, then it would clamp those two small wheels on the cable. So you, so it was, it was a screw type grip. That only the Clay Street Hill, the Presidio Ferries Railroad used those two because 
they were somewhat cumbersome. Um, yeah, but uh, that basically well, yeah, before you know, and, uh, in the early days, uh, you know, I mean, literally days, how they had a lot of problems you've already opened. The cars uh, tended to buck up a little bit sometimes, depending on how they did it or deep rip. They had a lot of problems uh, with that screw grip. You know, it's just kind of lower it, grab it. You know, it. Um, yeah, right, because yeah. Heppelsheimer was his, yeah. his engineer. And as Don years. said, there was one other company that used it, but uh, surprise, surprise, Holly was the president of the company. Yeah. And he had the patent on this one. Yes, he did. Patents were very important. And he had that, well, we'll go to that later. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you can see, yeah, I'm kind of Victorian here, but lots of old cable cars, just point out, you'll yeah. see the oil lamps up there on the, on the Clarence Street. And this is pretty, pretty basic. This is actually even a little nicer looking than they ended up being because Holly didn't have a lot of money. Everything was experimental. No, his dummies, his dummies are very basic. We'll see that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah there so you just go. a little close up there, what Don was saying, yeah. the screw grip, which you can see is bolted to yeah. the floor of the car. And here's yeah. your two. One, it's a hollow two. One raises and lowers the grip. The other one tightens it. So yeah. you know, you're kind of, you got to be pretty dexterous to work this thing. Yeah. But uh, again, you know, people were always trying to come up with new ideas because they didn't want to pay patents. We'll show you in a minute, but uh, Stanford, when he wanted to open his cable car railroad, he didn't want to have to pay Howley fees, so he kind of tried to fool around. It didn't work. The court said, no, you owe him so, but he was really embarrassed because Stanford doesn't pay anybody, but he had to pay Howley some, some patent fees. This one, it, it's just not very detailed, but I just want to show you the basic layout of his Clay Street Hill. So you've got your winding machinery here, yeah, right the cable. Is. You've got, you know, you're, you're going to have boilers in here for, yeah. you know, steam, you burn coal drawing the boilers, and then you have sheaves to direct the cables, okay? That was Halliday's. Um, this is Washington Mason today, okay? These were the plans for 1982-84 when they restored it. This is only the, the floor with the winding machine. You see the winding machinery here in the tension, so. Uh, it is, of course, different in some ways, but in a lot of ways, the, the ideas are very similar from early days on down. You just, you know, improve or not, you know? Okay, so when you come into the powerhouse museum, this is what you see. These are the uh, driving shifts. Well, two of them are the driving shifts, the others are the idlers. Halliday uh, came up with the idea of a figure eight drive to keep tension, you know, because tension is important yeah. on even the first day. Better wrap on the shifts, too. Yeah, so it keeps it tight and it keeps it uh, running. Because remember, with the in the mines, you had to have those grips on the end to keep the tension on the rope, okay? So uh, you see this day, uh, today, of course, We've got the, uh, the motors and the gear reducers. Uh, in the early days, it would have been driven on uh, steam, like everything in the 19th century. At the other end, we've got here the tension shoes. And those are mounted here, and they're on rollers. So they go back and forth to take up the slack or increase it. And then you have a, a 3,300 pounds, is that still something like that? Something like that. Yeah. Weight hanging in that pit. Yeah. Just to so keep. Makes it keeps a constant tension on the cable. Yeah. 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 Uh, there's a better picture of it. So mm -hmm. that's his 8,000 pounds. Yeah. Could be. Could be. Uh, Don knows they do this one. Uh, How did he start with about 3,000 pounds, I think, for his? Of course, he had a very short one. So that keeps the tension, as you can see, it rocks. And the, uh, the figure eight, the tension, I mean, how did he use all of these in what was a very experimental? Uh, you know, project. And just for, uh, you know, views, this is the, uh, these are the ships in the Washington Mason powerhouse directing the, the, the three lines, you know, uh, in house, okay? California High and Powell. Well, four lines, I should say. Three lines, the cable wire, but they have four cable on them. So they're directed in there and then directed, they call them shivs, and they have horizontal shivs and, and vertical shivs, and then carrier pulleys are smaller, that's what the Cable car, or the cable kind of rides on. Okay, that picture is up, it's going to be up here later if you want to take a look at it, but uh, Halliday chose Clay Street finally because the people of uh, Clay Street promised him about four grand, the ones who were living there. Uh, he also bought property, and it was about triple the value after the cable car became you know, settled. But it also was a pretty dramatic ascent. He thought it might be a little more showy than California Street because it's very steep and walking up there rises about 300 feet and only you know, a very short number of blocks. He located the powerhouse on the top, which means getting coal there with horses is a real bear, but it lessens the tension on the cable a little bit. 
And so it's a very steep, you gotta be very dramatic. Well, Clay Street came up with about two grand, maybe two and a half grand. They didn't give the four grand. Halliday had about 20 grand of his own money. Uh, Britton Ray and, um, what's the third one done? Uh, yeah, they were three friends in yeah. the mechanics who loaned him money. Yeah. He said later, not out of any confidence in what I was doing, but pure friendship. You know? <laughs> and then he finally got a loan from the Clay Street Bank. He had a little working model of his car down there. And they didn't really, Benjamin Brooks uh, had a franchise he bought out, but um, the Clay Street Bank, they weren't really sure he was going to do it, but they thought, well, we'll take a chance you know, on this. And actually, it turned out to be a very successful uh, investment. Okay, so one thing about franchises, the city said you can only charge a nickel, you can't interfere with the streets, you can't scare the horses. That was a big thing in San Francisco. Don't scare the horses, you know, because they cause mayhem. And you had to have it done within a certain period of time. I got surprised this today, but. Um, <laughs> so Halloween wasn't quite done on August 1st. You know, he still had some. Changes to make, some yeah, things yeah. iron out, the route wasn't complete. Uh, so he held it just after midnight on August 2nd. So he thought, well, no one will know. You know? And I don't know if they knew or not, but it really didn't matter. So the successful run was very late, actually almost early in the morning on August 2nd. Apparently, Halley uh, had had to tie the car to the neighboring lamppost because the brakes weren't quite ready. And uh, he got an old locomotive engineer named Jimmy Hewitt, tough guy from the mines. He was going to take the car down the street, inaugural run. He got out, looked down into the fog, he couldn't see the lower end, <laughs> shook his head and said, no, thank you, no. and left. <laughs> so Halley, the ever intrepid Halley, jumped in, took the grip, yeah. took the car safely down the hill, reversed it on the turntable, took it back up. It actually did work. And they all shook hands, they had a glass of water, Halley said that was all the probability. But according to legend, as they approached Mason Street, a Frenchman living on the route stuck his head out the window and threw a bouquet of flowers at the car. Whether it's true or not, it's been immortalized. And uh, that's another one of those things, as Brandon Bean used to say, the point is the story could have been true. <laughs> but it's a nice story, so we like to tell it. Yeah, <laughs> so the first official run that took place later that day, how did he, you know, put a few more things together, you know, screw it a few more bolts, uh, you know, polish it up. And at 5 p.m., this car, and now this is actually reputedly supposed to be much, this is Mr. Halliday and his wife in the front car. This is the dummy, without the trailer, obviously, uh, at the foot of Clay Street, waiting to take the inaugural run. According to legend, um, uh, Emperor Norton was there to give the blessing to the whole bear. Of course, Emperor Norton turns up at everything, so but I'm not saying he wasn't there. Halliday claimed he was. The fire chief, the police chief, the usual assortment of politicians and celebrities and people. Well, they piled up, I think about 90 people on this thing, which is not made for 90 people, yeah. you know, and a bullshit thing in the grip. So of course, everybody says, oh, see, how these folly doesn't work. Well, he ran up, got the, got the bolt, started going up the hill, then the rope started slipping. So he jumped off, looked it up the hill again, put some tar, you know, on the, on the ship, and finally made the top. Well, there was some doubt, and people were a little unsure, so Halliday gave everybody a month of free rides. Figured that would convince them, and it did. The thing became a real success. In a couple months, I think he had about, maybe, uh, what was it? I'm trying to think of the numbers. I think within about two years, he had about 150,000 people riding it monthly. You know, and he made tons of money, because his outlay wasn't all that much. You know, He used redwood, and, uh, you'll see in some of the pictures, very cheap construction. So how did he really made a financial coup with this? And it worked, and people started riding it, and of course these steep hills, and it did bring, brought a lot of population up the hills, later companies would too. Um, how he also, as I said, bought several lots that about tripled in value, so how he was a businessman. But the thing actually worked pretty well. A few things iron out, kind of finished the run, but you know, it really wouldn't work. This gives you a good uh, look at it once it was actually running officially. Uh, once again, they're telling me this is Mr. Howley. I don't know, it doesn't really look like him to me, but who am I to say it? He's in every picture. Um, but notice the planking. Much of the construction was done with redwood. The planking, the, um, the conduit, which you saw in the picture, you know, which the cable runs through. So it was really cheaply done, so he didn't have a lot of money, 
And later on, they would have to redo a lot of this once it was accepted and more permanent. But it really gives you kind of like a look at, you know, how primitive the conditions were, because how did he have to do this all at his own expense? You know, the city required this one. They didn't chip in for anything. But, you know, it's starting to get a little better developed here. You can see, of course, everybody's got their hat, their coat on. My grandmother would be very pleased because everybody had to wear one. Here's another view a little early, and you can see how underdeveloped really the streets were then, and only a very few houses. So you have one coming up, Mr. Halley, again, supposedly there, and one going down. So it really did bring development. It, um, it spurred, like, the building of homes. It brought settlement up Knob Hill because people just didn't build on the hills in San Francisco for very good reasons. And the Clay Street Hills started a trend with a lot of cable car companies that would follow it. Um, they always operated the... Uh, the dummy trailer model. Because how they thought at the level crossings, he just thought it would be better suited to that to come down and then you have the level crossing to stop. But later on, that'll be changed. And this is the terminal down on Clay Street. You can see here the terminus. There was a couple of, uh, of uh, turntables here because to turn these things is a bit of work. You know? And they even had horses there once in a while to help pull them because um, they're not like today where you have one car to run on. But uh, you can see, you know, Clay Street is getting pretty built up. Start going up the hills, businesses, people living there. And really, the, the, uh, they used to have something called the Real Estate Circular. And they were very big, as a magazine of realtors, they were very big on cable cars. In fact, they advertised lots for sale on cable car lines because they thought, you know, better value and people are going to buy them because then you can ride. It did so well that by 1879, uh, Halley did a short extension to Van Ness Avenue. This is Van Ness Avenue and Clay in about 1879. And you can see, west of Van Ness, there was nothing. Well, very little, let's say, okay? And uh, that's true for the very early years of cable car development. This is the chart Don made up for the 150th of Clay Street Hill, but then notice, very shortly, horse car operators, other transit people are looking at them and they're saying, wait a minute, the guy's got something here. You know, we could run a line and we could make money and people will ride it. At first they thought only on hills, but actually the Sutter Street, which was the, uh, the next company here, uh, they ran a lot of their car ran on level or fairly low grades, you know? So, uh, by the way, that just means low. I'm sure you all know that, but I got taken to task one time because I said, well, why do you think Sutter Street's a low grade street? I wasn't really being, you know, Criticizing it. But quickly started building cable cars. So we ended up with eight or, you know, private companies within a very short time. And it's a fascinating story. But this is the first of shameless plugs for Don. I mean, you're going to have to ask us back to tell the story of the eight original companies. And this is a map of it in 1891 at the height. This is cable car all over what was basically the city then, you can see. You know, down here, cable cars eight developed into the mission. People could now live in the Mission and commute downtown for a nickel. It started to move it westward into the Western Edition. So, you know, relatively short period of time, about 20 years behind the cable cars, it really brought development to a lot of areas of the city. It was such a novelty that uh, they sent it to the World's Fair in Chicago. Here we have Mr. Holiday's car, okay? This is car number um, eight, I believe. Did it say there? Yeah, original cable car at the uh, World's Fair. And in 1891, the company was sold to the Ferris Clubhouse. By now, a lot of companies were running in fact, 1880, 1891 was the last cable car built. The O'Farrell Jones and Hyde, part of which is in the Hyde Street car today. Okay. Okay. Um, louder? Okay. Uh, anyway, this is the newspaper from the era. It was sold and incorporated. Very soon, it was replaced by the Ferris Clubhouse with a Sacramento clay line uh, that ran much further out west, was a bigger car, and the old tracks were ripped out, and a bottle of champagne broken over the old rim is the truth. But Halley's cable car really got all this going, and we wouldn't have so much, even today we wouldn't have our cars, I think really without Halley's entrepreneurship. You know, he had a, an engineering Eppelsheimer, who invented the grip used today, much easier to use, okay? But um, Halley really was an entrepreneur. Okay, Don, I'm gonna let you take over these. All right. I have a few side things there.
aside to uh, Andrew Holliday's, uh, he paid for the transportation of the, the, the Clay Street dummy and trailer to the exposition in, in Chicago in 1895 or so. The ironic thing about that is that we got the dummy back, but they never sent us the trailer. So somewhere in Chicago, in some museum, is our trailer, and we should like to have that back. <laughs> Will that happen or not, we don't know. Well, I'm going to break up my talk into two sections. The first one I'm going to talk about, Andrew Halliday and his, well, his, what do you, what do you call it, his patent, his patent trust, and the other one I'm going to speak, speak about, the, the San Francisco cable car system, as it was from 1896, say, to about 1928. When the cable, can you hear me all right? Yep. Am I getting through? Okay, all right, well, this, in this period, the cable car was really a part of the fabric of San Francisco. It, it wasn't a tourist attraction like it is today. People actually rode the cable cars, they were part of the electric car system, the two worked part, uh, hand in hand, so to speak, and they were really, like I say, part of the, so it made the city work. Uh, well, I'm going to get into the patent trust right now. When Andrew Halliday realized that he, get, he had this concept of the cable car, he had a workable concept, he realized that a lot of smart people were gonna, re were gonna cash in on this, and he will also have a lot of competition from a lot of clever people. So he tried to more or less monopolize all his patents concerning cable cars. He had still an awful Eppelsheimer, he had er, Jacob Root, and a lot of people who developed better grips than he. He incorporated their designs into his patent trust. So the idea is you build a cable car system or you want to design or you have to buy a license, a patent license from his company. He had two of them. He had the um, he had the Pacific Cable Company that operated in the western part of the United States and he had the oh, I think it was the the American Cable Car Company that operated and handled the patents in the eastern part of the United States. So he really tried to monopolize the development and licensing of cable car trusts throughout the country. Um, what he did, he published this very nice brochure. In it he describes all the, basically the cable car systems that he designed for San Francisco. And he extols their virtues, they're well designed, and just, the, just it, it indicates this is the way to go if you want to build a cable car system. Now, he has a character stick too. Right in the preface, he tells you that we have all these wonderful patents. But if you elect not to use one of his patents, I will see you in court. <laughs> and he did. And you didn't have to go through far for him to, uh, it, it didn't take too much for him to bring you, bring me legal action against you, as I'm trying to say. Now as what he did, if you built a cable car system according to his patents, and sign his agreements, it was called the trust operation. And if you didn't do that, it was called a non-trust operation. And you didn't have to travel too far to see a non-trust and a trust operation in service. All you had to do was go over to Oakland. There, the Oakland Cable Railway Company that was built by the James Fair, he did the right thing. He bought the license. He did what he had to do. He, he operated a very, well, it was not a very exciting system. It went on St. San Pablo Avenue. It was kind of like Valencia Street. But it was a, 
It was well built, well designed, and it operated in a very satisfactory manner until about 1898 when it was electrified. Now, the flip side of that was the Consolidated Piedmont Cable Company, which operated a rather spectacular operation of, from, on Oakland Avenue from Lake Mayor up to what is be, well, what would become Piedmont after a while, and it was called the Consolidated Piedmont Cable Company. Well, they did by, they did everything in a non-trust manner. They developed a low-cost way of laying cable track, and uh, he was promptly sued by Halliday, but Halliday lost the suit, and uh, and they, the Consolidated Cable Car Company used this Jacobs patented trust, it was called, to lay their track. On the grips, however, they used uh, a variation of the Eppelsheimer bottom grip, and Halliday sued him again, and then Halliday won that one. So it was a win-one, lose-one situation throughout his career uh, in, with the, these various trusts. Um, one thing's for sure, whether he win or lose, he will sue you. And he spent a lot of time in court. And, well, and did it didn't work well. It did, he, he, he tried to trap everybody's it suit, but there was a lot of very prominent people. There was a Charles Chubb of Oakland who developed a very nice patent for the grip and the carrier wheels and a lot. And this is a very complete patent, and this is what I have to fight against. I'm going to put it on the table there, and you can take a look at it. And, well, let's see what I'll bring Move along here. Now, where did the trust work? Well, he had success with his trust in Chicago, Los Angeles, St. Louis, and Kansas City. But where he lost, and these became really principal non-trust operations, were in New York, Omaha, and Cincinnati. Well, to sum it up, the, the trust was very successful in protecting patents concerning the cable grip and hardware. But when it came to track and conduit, then the results are fair, fairly mixed. Now, a big highlight was the trust to secure the I'm probably missing here. Yeah, there you go. Halliday's big success was securing the omnibus railroad, omnibus railroad and cable cars uh, franchise. It was they built a large facility here in Oakland, in fact, and here in San Francisco. In fact, it's been said that this was a cable car line that was really built too late. By that time, the electric railway had come into to, to, the motors come in, came into the picture, and they could see that uh, even though there was complaints about the electric railway, about it and reliability and different things they didn't like the overhead system, uh, the handwriting was on the wall. So they actually opened. Uh, the Omnibus Railroad and Cable Company was his last successful uh, franchise. He tried a trick, though, that was very interesting in Dallas. There he, he actually was willing to finance the construction of this cable railway in return for uh, them purchasing a license for all the mechanical equipment. But nothing ever came to pass. But he really tried to move his financing beyond the trust licensing to want us maintain his control 
over the Caleb Valley mines. Well, what happened? Well, the the electric railway around the, the early 1890s, they steadily made a different cut into the construction of cable railways, and they realized that the handwriting was on the wall, and they let, if they weren't building cable railways, they didn't have to worry about how these patents. So it just quietly drifted off, and and, uh, and people, like I say, they be, became more accepted the overhead wire being strung in the streets, and, that, and it just quietly faded away. I have some photographs here. Oh, there's one, yeah, okay. Let's see, yeah, let's start the photograph, yeah. Yeah, so this is an interesting thing. After the fire and earthquake in San Francisco, the United Railroads wanted to just get rid of all their cable car lines, with the exception of maybe three operations. Well, and one of the, the thing, cities, the streets that they want to, wanted to bring to in, in, incorporate the electric service was Pacific Avenue between Polk and Divisadero Street. Well, a lot of prominent San Franciscans lived on Pacific Avenue. Uh, Spreckles, for one, and there were, there were many others, decided they did not want overhead wires. They wanted the cable car system restored. Well, the United Railroad said, hell no. But these people had enough influence, and they were wealthy enough, and they had enough drag that they persuaded the city of San Francisco to force the United Railroads to restore this short stretch of cable car trackage on Pacific Avenue between Polk and Visadero Street. This meant bringing back the old uh, dummy and trailer operation, which has long since been abandoned. And they were not happy with this at all. So they went out and they picked up five of the best dummy and trailer combinations they could find, and they, it, they brought them back for Pacific Avenue. And that operation lasted until about 1929, and it was very lightly patronized. As you can see, there's hardly anybody Writing thing and the, the dummies, you know, they 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 back in 18 about 1878 and they electrified them and they added stanchions to keep the roof from wobbling and they they just patched them up as best they could. But by 1929, they were really really falling apart. Uh, they were like I said, electrified and there's the one solid solitary customer riding in the front of the uh, the dummy there. That's an interesting thing, too. Um, before the advent of electricity, of course, you had a nice big oil lamp where that headlight is now. And that used to give out a lot of warmth. So people are cold in winter days in San Francisco. They love to hug love to get on those two front branches up there because that's nice and warm and they can have, they can have a nice evening ride on the cable car line. Well, shall we look one more hit? Wait, Mark. Wait, Mark. Okay, well, there's, there is a, the, another, proceed, another picture of the Pacific Avenue Dummy and Trader. You can see how tired they had become in 1929, and there's the obligatory conductor and equipment there posing on the steps. Now, that's taken at. Uh, Polk and yeah, Polk and Pacific at, at Avenue at the end of the line. Okay. Okay, now we're moving on to the this was the principal cable car powerhouse in San Francisco, located on Valencia Market Street. The this powerhouse powered the cable all the way down to the foot of Market Street, including powering the turntable, which was at the foot of the ferry building. And that was a huge complex with a couple of large steam engines in there. And it lasted until it was destroyed by the fire and earthquake in 196. It later became the track yard and they could fabricate a track in there. Uh, it used to be able to, there used to be a hatch there in front of the flax store. You could go in and you could see 
the galleries where these tables ran. Now there was no table or any machinery in there, but you could actually walk around in there. It was clean and dry, and many people have done it. I have not been that brave, personally. And this is a uh, this, this is a, as big as the table car ever became. That's a combination where they joined the dummy and the trailer, and they made a, a combination car out of it. This one is on the Hague Street turntable. The paint scheme is a real pretty uh, Pennsylvania red and cream, which would be the United Red was used before the fire and earthquake. There you can see that they closed the car in the front, and dash signs. It has all the accoutrements of being an electric car, except it's a 34 foot long cable car. Okay. Uh, this is a, an open car on Octavia and Hay Street, heading out to the the California League Ballpark out on Stanion and Waller, I think. That was a big draw in the 1890s, and you can see that uh, they really packed them in. See, that's a combination car inbound, uh, yeah, inbound on the opposite track, and they operated a, on a one car per hill route uh, law that only those two cars could be in that block. Uh, at once, to, so they wouldn't strain the cable too much. But that gives you an idea of well, how they packed them in on a Sunday in the 1890s. Okay, um, and here we see a cable car on display at the train to Valencia Street car house. Here she shows you the cable car in the background and the various components in the front. There's the truck with the grip, and uh, there is a little cart in front there that they used to lift the grip out of the car through a small door in the center. That's still done that way today with a, a regular motor truck in a, little, in a little bit more easier manner, but the idea is the same. And that's a, this particular cable car is actually, had, or has its origins as a horse car. The enclosed part of the cable car was once a Stephenson horse car that the that they more or less joined with an open section and converted to a cable car. This was done quite a bit in San Francisco in the early days. Okay. Uh, here's the Valencia, turning into Valencia car house and repair shop. This car house did a lot of conversion work, converting omnibus cable cars to electric cars right at the turn of the century. And this shows it. It's, it's conversion, uh, it's the, uh, let's see, no, no, that's right. This is the original con configuration of it, yeah. Uh, two turntable. And this, this is interesting. This it shows you how the cable car lines interface with the electric car lines. They added a single third rail between uh, Fillmore and Steiner Street to accommodate both the electric cars and the cable cars. You see a cable car on the on the tracks now about to swing down Steiner Street. And then the electric car continued out to on the to Jackson uh, to, to, on the end of the Jackson California line. That was a simple way of, of interfacing cable cars with the electric cars. Now we'll show you a very complicated way. Oh well another thing. Oh well I lied. Okay. In 1915, they decided that they're going to get the cable cars to modernize. They're going to modernize the system. So they took the Pacific Avenue dummy and they closed it and made this very attractive little cable car out of it. You know, it's a, basically it's based on the standard electric car design, operated by one man. It's, it's a very attractive looking little car. The only problem is nobody liked it. The operators hated it. The passengers hated it. So after a short time of service, it was shoved to the back of the barn and forgotten about. But it shows a lot of clever engineering and how they actually tried to bring the cable car system into the you know, early 20th century, you might say. Okay. Oh, this is uh, the five line in front of uh, USF. The, the reason I show, I, this is a particular interest, it shows the electric cars operating on cable car track, which is a really poor shape. 
The picture doesn't do it justice, but the track is in really horrible condition. And it operated like this for years. And it's, it's a wonder that there wasn't more problems with it than it, it was. The, it was quite noisy. And I know that the students and the faculty at USF did not care for the, the, uh, the noise at all. It bothered their lectures, supposedly. Oh, this, uh, this shows you a little bit of joint trackage. It's hard to see there. Coming off of Sacramento Street, you can see where the, the cable car track actually is part of the electric car track. Now, yeah, there you go. See, that shows how it was fabricated. This was done to eliminate a very bad curve called a death curve. So they reworked this in a very clever manner. You can see how that uh, uh, the third rail, this thing is really, really uh, a very complicated piece of trackage. What they did is they built it, they assembled it in a yard, first of all, and, and made sure that it would function properly, tuned it up a little bit, marked the parts, and took it out in the streets and laid it. And after laying it, they made a few further adjustments and into service it went. And supposedly, as complicated as it was, it worked beautifully. And no problem. Well, this is the end of it here. What we're seeing here is the end of the, the, the vast cable car line system that ran from the 2060 all the way down to the ferry building. This just, uh, this just shows the short portion between 18th Street and 26th Street. Just a, just a very big, less than a mile of the original system. That was one of the original cars operating on it. That's about August of 1939. And that is Castro Street. Note all the traffic, you know? And then look at the busyness. And there you can see another car in the background. They operated about two cars at a time on the system. And, uh, and it was <laughs> very widely patronized. And finally, in, I think, April of 1941, just shortly before Pearl Harbor, it was abandoned. But it was. Uh, it was quite a Tudor Hill system. And this was there the day it was abandoned. Yeah, yeah, they yeah out, they're all very sad looking. <laughs> yeah, that's they it. the car in black and say goodbye to the little shuttle. Yeah, there were more people there than there ever was on the line. Well, then. Okay, then I'm going to sum it up, right? Yeah, there, this is uh, just, just real quickly. This was his patent for the endless ropeway system. Uh, Don was talking about the patents. And he said how he defended these tooth and nails. So. Uh, this was the one that was very successful in the mines when they transferred to the cable cars. Um, as I mentioned before, just to close out Mr. Halliday, he was a very talented man. He was a regent. He was interregnum president of UC until Benjamin I. Wheeler came along in 1899. Uh, he was a big advocate for libraries, for schools. This is the Halliday building at 130 Sutter Honorium. This is a plaque that is still, I believe, down at, unless someone stolen it, down at uh, Kearney and Clay. So Halley is well remembered in the town. I mentioned before the Play Street Hill car. Well, that dummy trailer was sent to Chicago, then they were sent to Baltimore. They bounced around for a while, and eventually, only the dummy came back. And we have it at the Cable Car Museum. We don't know where the trailer is. We hope it's somewhere, but as the years pass, the likelihood is uh, kind of uh, dim. Uh, to celebrate, uh, Jose had a, a down at the museum. We had a bust of Mr. Halliday uh, created, which now sits in our foyer as you come in. And uh, Jose went out and bought flowers for her on her birthday. And so everybody came by to see her. Up here we have a little model, just closing. There was a man named Harry Westcott. He lived on Clay Street. He remembered the Clay Street Hill Railroad. During World War II, he made toys for kids. You can see him in the San Francisco News article. One of those toys was brought in by, I think it was his great-granddaughter some years back, crying, said she had it in her garage, she didn't know what to do with it, but she said, I can't just throw it away. So we said, okay, we'll take it. We have it here. We're building a display case for it. And just because Mr. Westcott is a great human interest story, we're going to put that on display at the Cable Car Museum. And there's Mr. Westcott. And that is the very dummy that we have up here with the track. So that, that is that. An incredible survey of the history of the cable cars. We are going to have um, a couple chairs for Don and Mike to chat in, and I'll come around with this microphone for folks that may.
they have questions about the credit cards, would someone like to kick us off with a question? Newspapers and produce that they weren't supposed to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, they hauled the mail for about 10 years, yeah. you know, but no, people always say, oh, they must have used them. No, they only rode with passengers. Okay, thank you. It, it's interesting that on the situation about coal, they had these little tiny two wheel coal carts in San Francisco, and they would have to make endless trips to these various powerhouses to load this, this coal. And uh, it's, it seemed like a very Labor intensive way to handle it with these carts, but that's what they did evidently. They dumped the carts, they had a coal bunker in the street, so you could actually just empty out the cart, shovel it in the bunker, and then the bunker would be fired into the boiler. But it still was awkward, it seemed rather clumsy, yeah. I should say around 1901. They did away with anthracite coal, and they went to crude oil. With the Standard Oil Refinery opening up in Richmond, all of a sudden there was a real, there was a real source of fuel oil. So they converted, I think, three of the larger, no, most of the larger power plants were converted to oil by night. Feel free to check some of the artifacts that are up here.